Brother George, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Exodus and chapter number 8. Exodus chapter number 8 as we go through the book of Exodus on Sunday morning. Exodus chapter number 8 and... If you were to pick out a portion of scripture that you'd be like, man, I'm so excited about preaching on, this probably would not be it. And, uh, but that's why we preach through the Bible, because the Word of God is better than any idea that we have, and it is all profitable. And so let's stand together with me, please, for the reading of God's Word. I'll read aloud as you follow along. Exodus and chapter number 8, and we'll read down to verse number 19 that we're, we'll try to make our way through much of the chapter today. Uh, Exodus chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 1, the Bible says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh, and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs, and the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall come up and come into thine house, and into thine bedchamber, And upon thy bed, and in the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and in thine ovens, and on thy kneading troughs. And the frogs shall come up uh, both on thee, and upon thy people, and all thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying unto Aaron, Stretch forth thy hand with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up. And covered the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me, for my people, and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee? And for thy servants and for thy people to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses that they may remain in the river only. And he said, tomorrow. And he said, let it be according to thy word that thou mayest know that there is none like the Lord our God. And the frogs uh, shall depart from thee and from thy houses and from thy servants and from thy people. And there shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried in the Lord because of the frogs which he had brought against Pharaoh, and the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. And when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he he hardened his heart, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod, and smite the dust of the land, that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And they did so. For Aaron stretched out his hand upon his rod, and smote the dust of the earth, and it became lice like man, like in man. And and in beasts, and all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lights, but they could not. For there were lice upon man and upon beasts. And then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we look at this portion of Scripture, Lord, that you might give us uh, the truth of it, Lord, that we might apply it to our own hearts and our own life, Lord, that we might um, learn from this negative example of Pharaoh, Lord, that we might heed the power of the Lord our God. Lord, we thank you for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. As we have gone through the book of Exodus, we have found that there is a reason that God is going to display these uh, plagues uh, upon the land of Egypt. There is a reason that He's going to bring them about, and specifically, the reason that He gave was so that the Egyptians would know that there is a God in Israel. So that the Egyptians might know that there's a God in Israel. Certainly the children of Israel should know God. But we even know the children of Israel are waning in their willingness to follow God in difficult times. That's why when Pharaoh said no the first time, the children of Israel said, we're out. We quit. And so certainly God would desire for them to follow them. But 
He wants Pharaoh and the Egyptians to know his power and to know who he is. And so what he's done is he's given a direct commandment via Moses to Pharaoh. And we often would view Pharaoh obviously as a negative example who responded negatively. But can I just stop for a minute and tell you, he was a man that got clear instruction from God. He got clear commandment from the word of God. And though God confirmed his hard heart, and though God uh, continued to confirm his hard heart, ultimately it was Pharaoh's response to God that produced the negativity that would come in his life. And can I tell you, that is not just what will happen to Pharaoh. We know this about God. God is good. God is not wicked. God is not evil. There is nothing that is unjust or unworthy that would come not only from God or that is attributed to God. God is good. You say, well, why would he do so much difficult or difficult or harsh or negative things uh, to people? Listen, he needs them to wake up. Have you ever needed somebody to bring something negative into your life in order for you to wake up? Yes. Okay. Is that not what the law enforcement do when they pull you over when you're doing 65 and a 45? They want you to wake up. And what they'll often tell you is if you keep doing this, you could end up getting in an accident. Let me give you something negative to help you wake up, to change your behavior. Okay? And what do we teach our children? Law enforcement is bad because they gave me a ticket. You know, we teach our children, okay? No, no, law enforcement is there to help keep us safe. Okay? Now, obviously, there are negative or people in law enforcement can do that which is bad. But we teach authority is there for protection even when they bring negativity into our life. Well, if we can attribute that to some earthly authority that has the ability to fail, we better be able to attribute that to a heavenly authority that does not have the ability to fail. So if God has brought something negative into our life, it is no doubt in response to our our response to God's word, our unwillingness to adhere or to obey God's word. And just like in Pharaoh's life, God often spends time repeating himself. Have you ever had God repeat himself to you over and over again through his word? He spends a lot of time repeating himself even in the word of God. Because it's not about whether it is clear. The message is clearly presented. So if there is a negative response in our life, it is because of our unwillingness to adhere to the clear presentation of the Word of God. Now, we understand this in the life of an unsaved person. Does God repeat Himself over and over and over again that a person that does not know Christ as their Savior needs to repent of their sin and put their faith and trust in Christ? Most certainly. He repeats it over and over and over again. And ultimately, there is a negative result that will take place in those that refuse to put their faith and trust in Christ. Ultimately, they will spend eternity in the lake of fire. So, as time goes by, wouldn't you think ultimately it is grace and goodness that God would bring things in their life to uh, catch their attention to say, I've told you this before, you better listen to me this time. I've told you this before, you better pay attention. You need to accept Christ as your Savior. You need to put your faith and trust in Christ. And I'm going to bring a little negativity or difficulty in your life because I want you to avoid some greater difficulty that would come as opposed to your eternal life spent in the lake of fire. We tell that to our children all the time as we constantly as parents bring difficulty into their life so they'll avoid some greater difficulty down the line what do they do when they what do we do when they reach for the plug on the wall we say go ahead do whatever feels good until it doesn't feel good no can you imagine a parent going well they got to learn here's a knife stick it in there they'll only do it once yeah yeah maybe but you know what biblical parents do they bring some difficulty into their life they say no don't do that they they might even come over and go don't do that 
And when you do this to a small child, an 18-month-old child, you go, don't do that. They scream like life just ended. Oh, they scream. And you as the parent go, you know that didn't hurt. But it would have hurt a lot worse if you'd have stuck your finger in the plug. And you know what, by nature, children do. This is what my Jackson did when he was about that age, 18, 20 months old. He'd come up to the plug and his mother would say, no, don't touch the plug. And he would take his finger and he would put it as close to the plug as he could without touching it and then look at his mother. (laughs) I'm not touching it. You can't do anything to me. And that's what we do with God. God says, don't do this. We're like, okay, we'll get as close as we can without touching it. Listen, God brings negativity or difficulty in our life in response to our unwillingness to respond to God's word appropriately. Now, let me say, not all difficulty or negativity in your life is God brought. Some difficulty or negativity in your life is just a result of bad choices. But God allows it nonetheless. And so here's Pharaoh here. You wonder, I I, I wonder, why frogs? Why frogs? You know, of all the things that God could do, why frogs? Well, there's several responses I'll give you to this. First of all, I really have no idea. I have some guesses, but I don't know exactly why. And here's my guesses. In Egyptian culture, the frog god was the god of fertility. In fact, the midwife was a woman, a lady who had a woman's body and a frog's head. Imagine that person coming when you're ready to deliver a baby. And the reason that probably they attributed that frog to the fertility goddess is the same that later that that some would attribute a rabbit to it because they produce with such rapidity. And there were many, many frogs in in, in Egypt And so they would view it as a fertility. However, in other parts of Egypt and other times during Egypt, they would also view frogs with a sense of negativity that frogs would carry an evil spirit and they were a little bit fearful of them. And so they were very superstitious. And this is just what it seems to be attributed. God used their own superstition against them, showing them that he had more power than anything that they attributed power to. And they had such, uh, and and we know that Pharaoh had a problem or he he viewed very uh, greatly the idea of population and growth and fertility. What began this whole conflict? There are more of them than there are of us. And so God says, let my people go. He's given him a week to think about it. For a week, Pharaoh's been sitting in his palace and people have been digging there about around the Nile River to get fresh water and bringing it to Pharaoh. You think Pharaoh did any digging? Probably not. He had other people digging for him so he could function with that. And so here Moses and Aaron come in and God says, go tell him again, repeat again, let my people go. The clear message of the Lord. And he says, if you refuse, I will smite your borders with frogs. Now, the passage ultimately is not about an in-depth study of frogs. The passage ultimately is about the result in an individual and a nation's life when they refuse to adhere to God's Word. And difficulty that's brought into his life in his negative response to God's Word or his unwillingness to adhere or change to God's Word. And look what it says here in verse in verse number, uh, verse number four, the frogs shall come up upon both thee and upon thy people and thy servants. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, says, stretch forth thy hand with a rod over the streams and rivers and the ponds and cause the frogs to come out of the land of Egypt. And so Pharaoh obviously had a negative response. Let my people go. And Pharaoh's response, no. And God brought the difficulty in the idea of frogs. Now, I was thinking about this. There's probably some towns in Florida that they think this was great. You ever had some good frog legs? Man, I love me some good frog legs. They are so good. I can imagine some places in Florida that would be like, oh, this is wonderful. 
or heaven. They even jump in the oven for them. That's what it says. They're in the oven. But this was an infestation. They were everywhere. And we might think about it in a sense of it being a little bit humorous. But I can tell you, for those folks that were going through it, it probably wasn't very humorous. A complete infestation. But it's interesting the process that God lays out of how they will come. Look what it says back in verse number 3. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house. He says, it will come into thine house, and into thy bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servant, and upon thy people, and in thine ovens, and into thy kneading troughs. He says, here's how the frogs are going to come. Can you imagine that scene when Aaron takes his rod and, and puts it above the waters of Egypt, and all of a sudden the frogs start coming? And here they come a-hopping, and you know where they go first? The very first place they go is they go to Pharaoh's house. They go right to Pharaoh's house. They go right to Pharaoh's bedchamber. They go right to Pharaoh's bed. The frogs become at first a private problem for Pharaoh. This difficulty becomes at first a private problem. And when we have a negative response to God's word, often the difficulty that God brings into our life is first a private problem. It's something that nobody else really gets to see. Something that happens in the quiet of the night as you turn and toss upon your bed. As you know what God wants you to do, but you're unwilling to respond properly to what God wants you to do. And the frogs came first and infested Pharaoh's house. And his negative response doesn't stay private. His negative response doesn't stay just his problem. It goes from his bed, his bedchamber, to infesting his whole house. Now we know Pharaoh had a wife. We know Pharaoh had children. Because we won't know what will happen to the firstborn. And when we have a negative response to God's word. And we, you say, well, nobody else knows what God has told me to do. Nobody else knows what God is. Nobody else knows that God has convicted me of this sin. Nobody else knows about this. Friend, it will start privately. But as you continue to respond negatively to God, it will begin to infest other areas of your life. It will begin to affect. And don't be so naive to think that you can compartmentalize your sin. Well, this is just my private sin. It doesn't affect anything. Oh, it will affect everything. And it starts to affect the house. It starts to affect the children. It starts to affect the servant. And what began as a private problem soon became a public problem. You ever seen somebody fall into sin or, or a family that uh, gets broken up or destroyed and you say something like, wow, I never thought it would happen to them. I never thought it would happen to them. Well, can I tell you, before it ever became public, there was a private response to God's word of disobedience. And can I tell you the goodness and the grace of God, the reason he brings that private discomfort, the reason he brings that private difficulty, the reason that your heart is churning is because he wants you to get right with him before it becomes public. But can I tell you what Pharaoh's response is? No. No. Even when Pharaoh has had enough, even when it's gone from private to house to public, so invasive it covered every area of their life. Finally, he says this in verse number 8, And Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses and Aaron said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me, when shall I entreat for thee? And for thy servant and for thy people to destroy the frogs and from thee and thy houses that they remain in the river only. And he said, tomorrow. Tomorrow. Can you imagine? Moses says, when do you want me to get rid of the frogs that are everywhere? In my house. In the living room. In my servant's house. My wife goes to cook and she opens the oven and frogs hop out. 
It is a complete infestation. When do you want to deal with it? Tomorrow. You say, well, what's the significance? It's not an infestation of frogs that are normally is a problem. It's the infestation of sin or difficulty brought by sin or difficulty allowed by God in our negative response to the Word of God and it infests our entire house and attitude and our home and our families and our marriages and finally we say, I've had enough. And God says, all right, when do you want to deal with it? Tomorrow. You know when, there's an old saying, you know when tomorrow comes? Never. Never comes. When do you want to deal with your sin? Tomorrow. When do you want to put your faith and trust in Christ and accept Him as your Savior? Tomorrow. When do you want to humble yourself and restore your marriage and and, and lead your family? Tomorrow. And tomorrow never comes. And all those things that are based in good intention, no, no, no. Pharaoh did not have good intention. You know what Pharaoh wanted? A change in circumstance. That's what he wanted. He wanted the frogs to leave, but he wanted to be able to keep his attitude. So he ultimately lied to God. I will let the people go. Did he let the people go? No. You say, man, that guy, he's pretty bad. Have you ever lied to God? I will not do this anymore. I will start doing this. I will commit my home to you. I will begin uh, sharing God's word with my family. I will begin praying. I will begin attending church. I will begin witnessing. I will stand up. I will avoid sin. I will do this stuff. Just make my life better. And God says, all right, let's see. And he changes your circumstance and reveals that there was never truly a heart change. There was just simply a desire for an easier life. Pharaoh just wanted the problems to be gone. And the problems were just represented by frogs. He wanted the difficulty gone. And as soon as he saw the difficulty was gone, he said, <sighs> there's a home that's about to break up or a marriage that's about to come apart or, or an, a, about to lose something precious to you. It's like, okay, 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 here's what I do. I, I'll start going to church. And we start going to church. And then the problems get better. And we go, well, I'm done. I know what I'll do. I'll, I'll, start, I'll start having family devotions. Honey, honey, don't, don't say these things. Don't say that we're going to not make it. Let's, let's start having family devotions together. Let's do that. We have family devotions together and your wife says, okay, I'll stay. So you have devotions for a week. She says she'll stay and then once she's kind of over it, so are you. So are you. It's not a change in heart. And I'll tell you, when I see this, not only in other people's life, when I see this in my life, can I tell you what my normal response is? We'll start tomorrow. We'll start tomorrow. I've heard preaching before. I mentioned this at the men's advance. I've heard preaching before and been convicted by preaching before. And I said, okay, I'm going to do right. And I said, I'll start tomorrow. And guess when I started? Never. Because tomorrow never comes. Tomorrow never comes. Why would you want to spend one, one more night with the frogs? Why would you want to do that? I think about Pharaoh going home that night. Getting ready to get in his bed and, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. Pushing all the Kermits aside. Crawling in bed and up, oh, there's still ten under the covers by his feet. As he lays there, they're hopping all around him and going, can't wait till tomorrow. He had his opportunity right now. But he did not have a change of heart. All he simply had was his desire for change of circumstance. And can I tell you, as Christians, we are often so circumstance-driven 
that we do not have a right attitude towards God, or as Brother George saying, there's no trembling towards the person of God, or there's no rejoicing towards the deliverance of God. We just want God to fix it. Amen. Just want God to fix it. And what God is looking for is a heart change, an attitude change. So we see here Pharaoh's response. Look what it says in verse number 14. Let's start in verse number 13. And the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses and out of the villages and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps and the land stank. I, let me just stop here for a minute. Getting your life right with God sometimes is going to take work. And sometimes it's not going to be fun. Sometimes it's going to stink a little bit. Having to sit your wife down and say, Honey, I'm not right with God. I don't have the right attitude. I don't have the right heart. I don't have the right mind. My life stinks right now. But it'd be better for there to be a little stink than continuing difficulty. They picked up all the frogs. Can you imagine the heaps? This word here is not talking about piles. Heaps of frogs. And how it would stink. Oh. But when Pharaoh saw that there was some relief, instead of Pharaoh recognizing, my, look at the power of God. Look at what God has done. You say, do you think really God was concerned about the attitude of some foreign leader? Have you read the story of Nebuchadnezzar? Does God desire for men to praise him and honor him and turn to him? You bet he does. And so here, the opportunity is there for Pharaoh to see the power of God, respond to the word of God, and he just goes, no more frogs. Oh, no more frogs. Like God can't do something else. And we have the same attitude. Got past that bill. She said she'd stay. My kids are asleep. Whatever it is, can I tell you, God's looking for a heart change, not just a circumstance change. And so Pharaoh says in verse number 15, but when Pharaoh saw there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. And so the Lord brought lice. And can you think about how bad frogs were? Lice. How much lice? Look what it says. And the Lord said unto Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land, that it might, may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Does anybody familiar with the topography of Egypt? You think there's a little bit of dust in Egypt? Man, the, now, you say, well, what's the big deal? It's interesting that the Egyptians were very, very particular in their uh, sanitary they wanted a very unique society. They were very particular in their sanity, uh, not sanity, in their cleanliness. Yeah, their cleanliness. There's a fancy word for that, and I forgot it. Hygiene. They were very concerned about that. In fact, the priest could not worship unless they were washed and cleaned, not only ceremonially, but in a general sense. They could not worship. This this infestation not only affected their physical life but now it had affected their life of worship it's interesting that this is the first plague that the magicians could not reduplicate they could not duplicate it they did they did the snake they did the water and the blood they did the frogs but now they could no longer do it they had lost their power they lost their power and their response is this is the finger of the lord you say, well, what, what does that have to do with us? Well, if we're going to put ourselves in the place of Pharaoh, you say, what kingdom do I have to rule? Friend, you have a kingdom to rule. It's the kingdom of your heart. You have the opportunity to surrender your heart to God, which will then produce activities for the Lord. But if you are unwilling to respond to God with your heart, and you just want circumstance change and not a heart change, 
you have difficulties that come into your life that first affect your private life and then affect your public life and then eventually will affect your worship life. And here are these magicians who they've been able to withstand and, and duplicate and still have power uh, that was no doubt demonic, but they still had power. And now all of a sudden, they could no longer perform. They could no longer have power. Their worship was affected because of their unwillingness to respond to God's word. Have you ever been in such a place that church was such kind of a... Ugh. Church was... There was no power there. There was no joy there. There was an unwilling, there seemed to be the, no ability to grow anymore. Can I tell you, this is a picture of a person or individual or family or nation that is unwilling to humble themselves before God and simply do what God tells them to do. And when we are unwilling to do what God tells us to do, it begins to affect every area of our life, our private life, our public life, and our life of worship. Man, I've seen it sometimes where people are so overwhelmed by sin or difficulties that you watch them during the singing. They just don't even have the ability to sing. Now, I'm not talking about ability. They just don't, they just, they're overwhelmed. I, I, you watch him during the preaching. And, and let me get off my high horse. I've been there listening to preaching, being convicted and having an attitude of, no, I do not want to respond properly. And it affected my fellowship. It affected my ability to have power with God. And here these priests were. They could no longer perform in their worship you think God knew the effect that the lice would have on these magicians? You think God knew the effect of it would have on their attitude that they put such a high emphasis on hygiene affected with their worship that God's selection of lice was the perfect thing that would totally destroy their ability and their joy in worship? If God knows how to destroy an Egyptian's worship, do you think he knows how to affect our worship? Child of God, do you think he knows how to help you see that your negative response or your unwillingness to do what God told you to do, he is not hearing your prayer? He is not hearing your song? You can go to the book of Isaiah, chapter number one. You know what God says about their meetings? He says, I hate them. I don't even like your songs or your melodies. Why? Why? Because they had not responded to God's word. You say, well, I'm okay, preacher. I haven't done any of the big ones. I haven't done any of the big sins. Can I tell you, God doesn't operate that way. He wants you to respond to whatever he tells you. You go home this afternoon. And you walk into your child's room and you see it's a mess. And you told them to pick it up before they came to church. And you walk in, you say, I thought I told you to clean your room. Hey, but I haven't robbed a bank. I haven't killed anybody. And the parent goes, oh, okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. I, I didn't realize you hadn't committed such egregious things. You know what the parent wants? The parent wants response to the command the parent gives. And if they want us to tell them not to kill anybody, we could probably tell them that too. But he wants response to what, and the response to this small thing, go in your room and clean up, a negative response to that, does that affect your fellowship with your children? Imagine if your children said to you, I will not go in my room and clean up. This is just a small thing in my eyes. Would that negatively affect your response? Would that affect your fellowship? Yeah. And we spend all the time going, well, this is not a big deal, God. This is a small thing in my eyes. This small commandment that you've given me. What's the big deal? 
Can I tell you what the big deal? God said to do it, so you better do it, or he will produce the negative things in your life to help you be reminded that you probably should have done it. Why is he so concerned with this? Because it's the word of the Lord. It's the command of God. And here we see Pharaoh double-minded. I will let them go. I will not let them go. In response to the lies, he says, I will not hearken unto the Lord. And so the Lord seems to take it up a notch. He goes from lice to flies. I don't know, have you guys ever seen these love bugs? Don't they drive you crazy? You got to wash your car all the time. Multiply them by a million. The picture here is there's so many flies, it's difficult to see. Man. At least the lice was unseen. It affected me. It bothered me. But at least it was unseen. But the flies? You can't even, you can't even function. You can't even operate. And you see the continual process that God brings in response to the negative response to His Word. To the unwillingness to be obedient to His Word. You say, are you trying to paint us as some sort of Pharaoh? No, no, I'm telling us that we have equal opportunity to either respond in obedience or disobedience to God. And why would you expect to God for God to treat us any different in disobedience than He treats anybody else in disobedience? Why would you expect God to give you a pass when you're unwilling to obey Him? Why would you expect God to go, oh, okay, I'll still bless your life. Okay, I won't, even though I know there's greater consequences coming, I won't warn you. You ever seen those flashing lights? Especially when when you're on a country road and it's one of those curvy roads. And normally it says flashing lights, it says 25 miles an hour. Who listens to those speed limit signs? Nobody, of course. And we're like, warning. There's a problem. I should probably slow down. Can you imagine if there were no flashing lights? How difficult it would be to drive. I remember about 10 years ago, I was driving. Somebody had given me a car. I think it was a cruel joke because it was a purple uh, neon uh, metro. I could fit it in my pocket. It was so small. But it was a blessing I got from A to B. Praise the Lord. And I was driving with the pastor one night over in Zephyr Hills on one of the back roads, and I was probably going faster than I should have. And there were no signs. And the fast curve came up, and I didn't see it. And once I saw it, it was almost too late. I yanked on that steering wheel, and we almost went on two wheels. I saw my life flash before my eyes. My attitude towards those signs were different. Before that, they had simply been an annoyance. And now I'm thankful that they're there. And sometimes we attribute God's mm, direction, warnings in our life, lines, guidelines in our life, as just simply annoyance. Can I tell you, friend, when you about run off the road in your life, you'll be glad they were there. You'll be glad they were there. It'd be better to spend a little time with frogs and lice, and flies, than to have your firstborn die. Thank God for the warnings. They hated the plagues when they were happening. But imagine the attitude when they were done. Which plagues do you think they would have rather have? The first three or the last one? You say, are are you impending doom? No, no, no. I trust God's direction in our life. I trust God's response in our life. But I will tell you this. There's a simple principle. Respond in obedience to God's word. Well, pastor, God's not telling me anything. Oh, man. I wouldn't want to be in that place. I wouldn't want to be in that place. Run and humble yourself before God. Do you know him as your personal savior? God speaks to his children. 
Do you know Christ as your personal Savior? Or maybe you have spent so much time responding in negativity or disobedience that the greatest thing and the difficulty God could bring in your life is to remove His fellowship from you. Respond in obedience to God's Word. You say, what is God telling me? I don't know. Listen to God. What sin does He want me to stop? Listen to God. What service does He want me to start doing? Listen to God. How does He want me to change my home life, my family life, my marriage life? Listen to God. It's never a problem of clarity of message. It's always a problem of obedient response. Let's pray. But I pray that you'd help us. Lord, perhaps even this morning you have convicted hearts about their response to your word. That there is clear communication from your word. That you would have them to do this or to not do this or or to walk in obedience or to change the, the way they do things in their, in their personal life or their private life or their home life or their job life or whatever it is, Lord. You've clearly given them the truth. You've clearly presented to them your will. And there's a negative response to it. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to recognize that you are not going to be mocked. that we should recognize your authority in our life and respond accordingly.